So we're going to continue with the, the our fifth vital sign, which is pain. And so every time we take vital signs, every time we do our temperature, pulse, respirations, and blood pressure, we are required, it is actually a Joint Commission standard, that you will ask your patient if they are having pain. So we ask them on a scale of 0 to 10, 0 being no pain, 10 being the worst pain they could possibly imagine, where would their pain level be? We want it on a definitive scale because if you just say they're in a little pain or a lot of pain, that can mean something different to everybody. When you put a distinct value, a number value to it, then you can, dis you know, then when the nurse gives them pain medication um, or you're doing comfort measures for them to help try to take care of that pain, you can actually determine if it's getting better, if, it's, if we're going in the direction, if your pain scale numbers are getting lower, if we're doing better. If it's not, then they need to rethink what the way we're treating the pain and maybe do something different. If the person cannot speak or, the per, or it's a small child, they also do the Wong Baker Faces Pain Scale rating, which has pictures of these faces, and they're from happy faces to sad faces to crying faces to screaming faces, and kind of where would they rate the pain by pointing to that picture. Or if it's a little infant, sometimes the nurse has to judge where that face would be. If your patient is having pain, we need to notify the nurse. It is a very subjective um, symptom. It is not something that generally, you can't determine if someone's having pain or not having pain. When the person's, you, well, okay, I shouldn't say that. You actually can if they are an infant. If you look at the, your Wong Baker faces pain scale, you can kind of determine where you think they would be. But when you have a person that's awake and alert and talking to you and they're telling you they're having pain, it doesn't matter if it, gee, you just heard them laughing with their visitors or gee, they just went to activities. They weren't acting like they were having a lot of pain. That is not for you to decide. It is a subjective data and it is something that when they are telling you they're having pain, we have to treat them as if they are having pain. So our responsibility is gonna to be to notify that nurse. Now, when you notify the nurse that they're having pain, I am going to tell you, I would highly recommend that you come back into the room after you've told the nurse and just say, you know, I let the nurse know you were having pain and that you wanted something for it. Please call me. If, if they don't come in in the next 15 or 20 minutes because the nurse was busy, please call me and I'll check on it for you. That is going to give you a better trust and a better, better rapport with your patient. And the other thing is, is when they're having pain, you can go tell the nurse and then when you come back to let them know you did that, now you can do comfort measures for them. Let's see if maybe they want to be repositioned, if maybe they'd like a back massage, maybe we could play some soft music, maybe have them watch TV. Distraction works beautifully for pain. If you've ever had a really bad headache and you still had to get up in the morning and you still had to feed your kids and get them off to school and go to work and then you get home in the evening, you crawl in bed and it's like, oh wow, my head is still killing me. And it's not that it wasn't bothering you before, it's not that that pain wasn't there, it's just distraction was keeping you from focusing on it. So distraction works beautifully with pain. Another thing we're going to talk about is a pulse oximeter. Now, this is not technically a vital sign. So, um, but it, I mean, when we talk about vital signs, the five vital signs are your temperature, your pulse, your respirations, your blood pressure, and your pain level. And we actually chart them in that order. They're charted in TPR order. T is temperature, P is pulse, R is respirations, and then blood pressure, and then we do pain, pain values. But if you work on a cardiac floor, if you happen to work in a hospital as a CNA and you work on a floor that takes care of heart patients or respiratory patients, patients with breathing problems, or you work in an ICU, CCU, they will always routinely have you do a pulse oximeter with your vital signs in addition to the other five. And it's a non-invasive testing. It's not something you have to have a doctor's or a nurse's order for. So for instance, if you go in and look at your patient and you're like, gee, you know, maybe their breathing looks a little off to me. Um, you definitely want to make sure you tell the nurse, but one of the first things they're going to ask you to do is get a pulse oximeter for that patient and see what it is. It measures the amount of oxygen that's in the blood. And they actually have pulse oximeters on their electronic vital sign machines. And then there's little portable ones as well. A normal pulse oximeter is 95 to 100%. And some books use the value 94 to 100, some are 95 to 100, but either way, 94, 95 to 100 is fine. It's a really simple machine. It looks like a big clothes pen. It just clips right onto the finger and it will transmit a pulse oximeter, an oxygen value, and a heart rate. 
And the reason that heart rate is really cool is because you've already checked your vital signs. You already did your pulse and your, your respirations and your blood pressure. And so now you put this pulse oximeter on. So let's say that I checked their heart rate and I was getting 60. And you put the pulse oximeter on and it's getting 82. Something's not reading right. Either it doesn't have to be the exact same value because your, your heart rate fluctuates continuously but it should be in that range of close nearby or probably within 10 points of where we got. If it doesn't, I would have to question if this is giving you an accurate measurement. Or let's say I got 70 for a heart rate and it's recording 100, or I got 100 and it's recording 70. That's telling me it's not picking everything up correctly. So it, that, that heart rate is kind of nice because it's kind of an indicator for you as to whether or not it's, it's reading correctly. Now this is a small portable one. Um, and so it just turns on and you can actually just buy these on Amazon for that matter and some of the nurses do just because they get tired of having to look around at the hospital for them or in the nursing home for them. Uh, and you just clip it on your finger and what it does is it shines an infrared light in between, um, in through your nail bed into the blood, in, it hits up against the um, hemoglobin in the blood in the red blood cells and flashes back a reading and it'll let you know how much oxygenation is in it's binded with that red blood cell. And so this one here is telling me that I have 96% oxygenation and my heart rate is 76. Okay, so it's quick, it's simple, it's painless. You do not need to have an order to do this. Um, if you're ever concerned about oxygenation, this is a this is something that you could do to, to measure it, to monitor it. As far as promoting comfort and relieving that pain, like I said, most times the nurses will give the patient pain medication. We already talked about positioning for comfort, keeping bed linens wrinkle-free. It's very uncomfortable to lay on a wrinkled bed. Um, helping with elimination, make sure they're not laying anything, laying on any of their tubes, laying on anything that shouldn't be in that bed. Handle and treat them gently in voice and in movements. You can try massage and always practice safety measures as well. So when we're looking at our vital signs, um, that temperature was the measurement of the heat produced. Okay, and we said normal is around 98.6, plus or minus a degree, a little higher in rectal, a little less in axillary. Heart rate, pulse, normal is 60 to 100 for an adult. Okay higher for children, but I only care that you memorize adult rate ranges. I just want you to know that the adult range is 60 to 100 and that children's are usually higher. Respirations, we said for an adult, 12 to 20 is normal range, though I've got to be honest, a lot of your elderly adults are sometimes going to run 22, 23, and you're going to go tell the nurse, I'm like, eh, who cares? Um, but if, you know, if it doesn't look like they're having any distress. Um, but was still something we'd want to make sure that we're aware of, that we, that we notify them. Respiration should be quiet and unlabored, no sounds when they're breathing. And then we had our blood pressure. And we have our systolic pressure, which is at a normal is 90 to 120. And our diastolic pressure, where normal is 60 to 80. So our pain, normal is zero. That's the normal pain level. Now I have to be honest with the pain. Sometimes patients never really get back down. Patients with long-term chronic pain issues, sometimes they never get down to zero. But we have to get them down to the lowest level that we can keep them as comfortable as possible. The last thing we're going to talk about with our vital signs is when we have patients on isolation. So when patients are on isolation, and remember when we talked about infection control, we talked about contact isolation, things that can you know, spread because we contacted them and then spread them to another person. So usually for contact isolation, we're usually wearing gloves and gown for any time we're going to be touching the patient or the patient's belongings. We talked about droplet precautions, and droplet precautions is any time we come within three to five feet of people, we need to make sure we're wearing gown, mask, and gloves. And then we talked about airborne precautions where we need to have all of that gear on before we even step into that room. When a patient's on isolation, we do not want to be taking in our stethoscope and our blood pressure cuff and our portable oxygen saturation. We don't want to be taking our equipment into that room because if we do take it into that room, it has to be completely decontaminated when it comes out. 
So if we take in that electronic machine, it's got that entire machine has to be completely decontaminated when it comes out. So they should have their own blood pressure cuff that's going to stay in the room and their own stethoscope. They're not usually great stethoscopes, they're kind of inexpensive ones, but they work. So they'll usually have their own blood pressure cuff and stethoscope in their room. They'll usually have a little portable thermometer, either the, the little Tempadot ones or they'll have the digital ones, just the ones like what you would see at home with the plastic sheath covers. And so we usually leave those in the room as well because we do not want that equipment to be coming in and out of that room and then potentially going into another room if it didn't get decontaminated properly and potentially spread that infection. After we take our vital signs, we want to provide for comfort. So make sure the call light's in reach. And this is true for anything that we do for our residents. Any procedure, any treatment we do, when we're all done, we want to make sure that our bed's in low position. If we raised it up for good body mechanics while we're taking our vital signs, we want to make sure it gets lowered back down. So we're going to make sure that we have um, um, lowered the bed back down, put the call light in reach, just do that safety check of the room, okay? Does everything look okay? The things that they normally reach, can they reach them? Um, we would want to make sure that if they see if they need to use the restroom while we're there before we just walk out on them. We want to make sure we wash our hands. And then, of course, we would report any abnormal values and record our vital signs. If we have abnormal vital signs, we really do need to report those immediately. We want to make sure we let the nurse know as soon as possible. And again, that goes in that TPR, blood pressure, pain, order. Now as far as cleaning our equipment, so I mentioned here with this um, stethoscope, we always clean earpieces and the diaphragm, any part that's going to touch the patient in between each patient. But if it was an isolation patient, um, we would actually have to decontaminate our entire stethoscope. And even our blood pressure cuff. And even though we document in a TPR blood pressure order, a lot of times what I like to do is I like to do my blood pressure first because then I can take a, a lot of um, places they have sani wipes in the room. I'll just take a sani wipe and wipe down my blood pressure cuff or I'll take some sanitizer on a paper towel, wipe my blood pressure cuff so it can be drying between them and you know the next patient. It, the alcohol on them dries pretty quickly, but still it's, it is going to get a little bit damp. So you might want to consider doing that. Um, this is what an electronic chart looks like. So when we are charting vital signs, there's usually a place here for vital signs. It'll say oral, axillary, tympanic, and there's usually a place for temporal nowadays as well. And so you would just click in that box and fill it in. So if I did orally, I'd click on the, oops, sorry, I'd click on the oral box and I would just fill in my value. The heart rate, okay, let's say I got 76 beats per minute. I just have to chart, drop in that 76. Respiratory rate. I would have to put in 12 or 20 or whatever the respiratory rate is that I counted per minute. And then our systolic blood pressure over the diastolic. So systolic blood pressure is what the pressure is on the in the contraction phase of the heart. Diastolic is what the blood pressure is in the resting phase of the heart. So it is systolic over diastolic, okay, is how we document that. And then if we had to if we have an oxygen patient, again, we do our oxygen SPO2 is for our oxygen saturation and our oxygen therapy when you click on this it'll say nasal cannula mask it'll be like a drop down box that you click on and then you can put in how many flow liters now the nurse can actually do that component of it but the vital signs up here is something that you would do it there is usually another scale over here for pain assessment so no actual or suspected pain and yes if you click yes there'll be another drop down box again so you can document where the pain is and what the pain level would be so this is kind of what the electronic charting looks like that we would do in the uh, facility now some places still do kind of old school graphing for their vital signs not too many do that anymore but the date goes up here and then there's usually increments of every four hours there's a place for you to write your blood pressure. So you see how it's 122 over 78. So systolic over diastolic. They took it in the left arm. They put the temperature. So our temperature was 98.6. They put a dot on it. And then what they do is they graph it from the previous one. So you can kind of tell if it's going up or down or just kind of staying fairly consistent. Temperature route. We took it orally. That means by mouth. Okay. So remember, oral is by mouth, tympanic is in the ear, temporal is across the artery, axillary is in under the arm, and then rectal, of course, is in the bottom. 
and then our respirations were 18. So some places will still have a, a graph. As far as how often you need to do vital signs for your patient, it will really depend on where you're working. So generally in a nursing home, again, if their health has been stable, if there's not anything new going on with them and their health is stable, some some of the residents only get vital signs once a week because again i mean how if you're if you're healthy i mean they're healthy they may have disabilities that are keeping them from being able to do their own activities of daily living but if their health is stable they don't necessarily need to have vitals done every day so you're going to find in the nursing home that some of the residents almost everybody gets it once a week but some of them will get it every day and some of them even more if they're getting blood pressure medications or heart medications they may get it every shift even so generally the nurse will tell you, I need vital signs on this room, this room, this room, this room, and this room. And you would need to make sure that you went and got those done and then report back to them with the values because their medications and things will probably be adjusted to that, to what those values are. So that will end our segment on vital signs.